And so they're not just recruiting footballers, they're recruiting student athletes. And so there's, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? It's like the volume of things. There's so many building blocks you have to nail out or iron out before you even get to the point where having that conversation with a coach, either face-to-face, -face, over email, text message call, even happens. All right, on to our guest. I've got a great one for today. Um, out of the Pac Northwest area originally, on to playing professionally now in Nisa here in the States. I'm so excited he's here. He's a pro footballer, he's a content creator. The guy is a jack of all trades. We have Noah Cavanaugh on the show today. Noah, my man, how are you? Very good. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, man. I'm so glad that you're here. It's not, not very often that we get to have, you know, pro players who are also content creators coming on, talking about their journey and kind of how they were brought into this game. This episode, it, it really is pretty special for me, man. So again, thank you. I, it means more than you know. Um, I'm excited that you're here. Let's uh, let's definitely jump into your journey. But before we do, the audience already knows what question we're going to ask, right? Noah, who are you today? Today, I am somebody who is incredibly process-driven and incredibly immersed in what my why is. That's That's it. That's me. I love it, man. Your why. And, and we'll talk about your why, right? Why that's so important to you. What drives you every day? You mentioned your process. I think off screen before we got on today, you alluded to a little bit, um, but we'll talk about it. I think it's for those who have yet to kind of jump into either soccer in a big way or content creation in a massive way, but are, are kind of wired the same way that you're wired. I think this episode is going to be massively impactful. So mm -hmm. let's jump into it, man. Um, earliest memories of football. That's kind of where I want to start in the beginning. We'll scale that into kind of the journey that you're on today. But from the very beginning, man, I'm, I'm always very curious when I get a chance to meet pro players because the, the, the level of dedication and sacrifice that's required to really hone your craft the way that you do, it's real. And even more so in a country where this is not anywhere close to being the popular sport, right? Um, you, you almost kind of have to have a, a different type of love and passion for this game mm -hmm. because it doesn't come with all of that attention that it gets in other countries. So let's talk about it, man. Let's start from the beginning. How were you brought into your into this game? What are your earliest memories of football or soccer? I started playing rec soccer probably when I could walk. I mean, that was the, the earliest memories was four, three, four, five years old, playing on a little rec team, played with those little felt indoor balls on a basketball oh, yeah. court. So yeah. way back, you know, way when that was a thing. And uh, I'm not actually sure if those still exist anymore, but <laughs> I, uh, I haven't seen them since like eighth grade PE basically. And yep. uh, so, yeah, so we played indoor at a really young age, you know, when you're still wearing your little tennis shoes and stuff, there's no such thing as a cleats anymore. And then sort of moved outdoors probably when I was six or seven, I really start to remember the importance of football in my life right around nine or 10 years old. That's where it really started clicking. And I really started to have the love for the game. My parents were very keen on me playing multiple sports when I was younger. So I played three sports, two to three sports up until the age of 14, when I graduated from well, graduated from eighth grade and then jumped into high school. And then in high sure. school, they basically said, Hey, you can do whatever you want. Now you've had your, you know, you tried some things, you've enjoyed some things you haven't enjoyed some things. Totally fine. Here we go. But 10 years old was, I started going to a camp called success soccer camp and it was run by the, at, at the time, the sports psychologist from the women's U S national team, um, oh, Dr. Wow. Colleen Hacker, who is a professor as well at uh, Pacific Lutheran University in the Tacoma area, just south of Seattle. And that whole camp was based on teamwork. It was based on values. It was based on how you interact as a person with your teammates. And whether it was falling in love with that aspect of the camp or whether it was just a fun camp from a soccer perspective to be at, it, it was life-changing for me in a lot of ways. And I ended up being a, a camper there, so to speak, for eight or 10 years. And then I was a counselor, a coach there for another four after that until I was wow. 20, 20 some in college. And so for me, that experience really sort of kicked off this, no matter what, whether I was playing basketball with my dad's team or whether I was doing swim team at an elite level or whatever it was, football was always, I was going home after swim practice to juggle a ball in the street. Like there was no, there was never a competition for me. Yeah, absolutely, man. And look, talk to me about, and you mentioned this, this, this camp that was so pivotal uh, for you. And I want to dig into that here in just a second, but I, I also want to bring the audience into what soccer's like growing up in the PAC Northwest, right? You mentioned Seattle and kind of some of the resources they have out there. 
today, Seattle's known as quite, you know, quite a, you know, this hotbed, if you will, for soccer fans to an extent, right? The Sounders have this massive supporting. Um, I think at the end of the day, um, there's so much going on from a grassroots soccer standpoint in Seattle that not a lot of people hear about or know about. So mm-hmm. walk us through that aspect of, of your life. What was it like to grow up as a soccer fan out there during your upbringing? Definitely. So I know we had mentioned a little bit prior to the show starting about the differences between the generations of players and how you can kind of create some understanding through storytelling. And Mm -hmm. for me, that's a very, it's a very powerful tool because when I grew up, it was basically the, the three or four years right before all of this academy stuff started coming out. So we had, by the time I was 14, we had just gotten the Sounders Development Academy. So the DA just had started when I was 14, right? So we had already gone through years of, I had been in club soccer at that point or premier soccer as we called it. That was, you know, right below, I don't know what even it's called now. Maybe it's RCL or something sure, uh, and, or, or ECNL or whatever it is, but we, the DA came into Washington state and it was crossfire and sounders when I was 14 and there was a 16s team and an 18s team. And that was it. There was no, there was like a pre-academy at 14 years old that some of the guys fell into, which was fantastic for them. I got recruited to Sounders through a tryout early on, decided not to because I had already committed to a different team, ended up in the crossfire system. But that was really it from when I was growing up. But there was a massive organization around youth football in general. So we had there there wasn't the same level of individual trainers or the emphasis on nutrition or sports psychology or all that, but there definitely was a plethora of options. If you were a 14 year old, talented, hardworking individual who wanted to join a premier club, there was plenty around and more developing as I grew up. So that was, you know, and whereas nowadays there's individual trainer, you know, EJ football training is a group that I worked with and they do, all they do all of the extra works for the Sounders crew and the Crossfire crew. And now there's giant clubs who are now succeeding at the national youth level. And, you know, so it's now grown into what it is today, I would say, but I was sort of on the very tail end of the generation of players who had club soccer and that was the highest you were going to get. So the, you know, we were the best club team in the state and we went to regionals and nationals and stuff, but that was like, that was the best before the DA actually existed. Yeah, 100%, man. And I'm, I'm kind of that same boat. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, when I was coming up to the FC Dallas youth system, that was kind of it. My senior year of high school is when the DA started. Like, mm-hmm. I remember, you know, click kids in Dallas, like lining up to try out for, I think there were only four academies in, in Dallas that were selected. And uh, FC Dallas was a major one, but then you had the, the Texans and Solar and Andromeda. So like, there were, there were a few other ones, but uh, that was really it. You kind of had to pick one of the four that you really wanted to try out for and, and go go pick, play your, 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 your academy ball. And that was it. We didn't know what it could become because up to that point, traditional club soccer, when you went to regionals or the nationals, that was the height of it. You, there was nothing mm-hmm. more competitive offered. Um, and so going into that process a little bit, right? Just maybe leaving DA stuff aside, or if you want to touch on it, on it you definitely can. But I really want to highlight some of the work that you had to kind of put in at the club soccer level. I think that that part for me today is still, it still requires some debunking. Cause I think certain players, youth players out there feel that the training sessions they receive in a team environment at the club level is enough that that's all they really need to kind of make it to the collegiate game or to make it on a path to pro. And I, I, as a pro player, I'm really curious for your take here. Um, And maybe you can kind of highlight it with your own experiences, but the level of, work that you really kind of were, were required to put in and the sacrifices you that you made either socially or from a family perspective, whatever the case may be, as you were coming up in those formative high school years, what, what was that like? From 13 or 14, I'd say that was when it clicked for me that pro football was going to be where I wanted to end up. And of course, process then becomes part of that, right? So maybe I didn't have the formal language like I do now to talk about it. But back then it was Pro football is what I want to do. And so mm-hmm. what is, how do I reverse engineer that massive goal? Because again, at the time, club soccer, cool. Then you have some division one schools that are starting to recruit you and D3 and D2. And there's that college thing. 
which was a must from my parents' perspective. So that's family upbringing as well. That was something that they said, hey, if you're going to do the pro thing, no problem, but you have to get the education first. So I said, all right, fine, no worries. That's just part of the process. And so how do I, how do I engineer my way to the goal that I have or to the, to the next step, I guess? And I think to, to put it plainly, I would say the amount of work I did off the field, as in non-team sessions, probably outweighs just in time value a factor of six or seven to one it's not even close wow. it's not wow. even close and i am lucky to be gifted athletically but that does nothing for me if i didn't work at it from a football perspective right like i could be yep. i could be a distance runner awesome amazing uh and i could but I wanted to do football. And so what did I have to do? I had to make the sacrifices, not going to part. I didn't drink until I was 22. Hit like, you know, maybe one or two parties in high school, maybe. Like mm -hmm. I was I was the kid in the, you know, dungeon because we had concrete walls in our, in our high school down in the dungeon. Yeah. So I would take a soccer ball at lunchtime. We had a 45 minute break and I would go do drills against the wall in, and then shower in the locker room and go to class. Like that was my routine. And you know, maybe I'm an outlier in that. I don't know. But all of the guys that I talk to who are at this level now have done something like that, who have have grinded. They've they've had to do something a little bit different where they might have sacrificed social status, whatever that means in high school. I mean, it doesn't mean anything now, obviously, as you know, you know, like what, definitely what, not. <laughs> yeah. Your, your stand, your social standing in high school means absolutely nothing now. Uh, and so and, and same in college as well. So in, in high school, it was you know, making varsity freshman year, super high, high. But then as the season goes on, I played five games out of however many in high school soccer. Cause again, before the DA, you were able to do both. So you did yep. club soccer in the summer and the fall and then, and in the winter, I guess. And then the spring was the high school. And so when I wasn't playing in high school, we lived about six miles or so from the high school that I went to. And so I would have my parents come and pick me up. I'd throw my, throw my stuff in their car, in my dad's car, in my mom's car and be like, all right, see, you, I'll meet you at home. And I'd sprint home basically. And I just wow. run home. Cause I was like, I, I'm, I'm missing this game fitness. So like, I got to make it up somehow, you know, I got to do extras. Yeah. I got to do this stuff. And so for me, the, the motto early on was, I don't remember where this came from. And this is at some point, maybe I'll think of it and send it to you. Uh, but I, uh, there was this motto that uh, some motivational speaker or some psychologist or something had said during a talk at a, they're not called combines, they're called showcase showcases, like a youth yep. showcase for, uh, for colleges. And they had a psychologist come in and he goes, you guys should be pissed off for greatness. And that quote has stayed with me for years and years and years. And that's exactly how I would describe my experience in high school was, okay, you're pissed off. You didn't play well, be pissed off for greatness. So go work harder. Yeah. And that to me was always, 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 always the motto. Yeah, seriously, man. I think, you know, you're that, that aspect of it all to me, because even now, right. I mean, I'll, I'll meet players, youth players every now and then. And some of the first questions that I have are just what are what is their routine really like, right? Especially mm -hmm. when when I get parents who want me to you know relay some advice, you know, I, I think that that's something that um, you know I, I didn't have anywhere near the career that you had. But I think you know for for parents, they see someone who went on, got an education, used soccer as a tool to kind of lower the, the bottom line price of that education, and even if it didn't pan out to a path to pro, they would like for their child to go down maybe a similar path. But when I start asking those questions around, okay, well, how much are you actually playing? You know, how badly do you want to be on that field? And when I hear the response, well, you know, we train like three times a week, you know, every now and then I'll mix it up with like a, a weekend session at home, maybe just doing shooting, maybe just doing juggling and that's it. And it's like, you need to put so much work. I don't even know where to start. Right. I think that, you know, it, the way that I always saw it, team training sessions were my ability to polish up and sharpen what I had been working on at home, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, great. Now, just, just like a match. For me, training sessions were always supposed to be more difficult. And then the match is when you put it all together, right? It should feel not easy, but it should feel like, okay, I'm just now doing what I've been doing in training um, at a level that's more realistic and moves at a game tempo. I'm not, you know, doing sprints for 45 minutes. I'm not, you know, doing touches for for an hour and a half. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's still... 
in 2023 blows my mind when I hear players um, that don't feel that they need those extra touches, whether they're at home or elsewhere, right? You mentioned the dungeon. Mm-hmm. Um, when they don't, it's like they don't, they don't need that to make it to the next level. Um, from your perspective, moving past the work ethic part and transitioning to what I felt could be a part-time job or a full-time job for any player who's trying to make it to the collegiate level, the recruitment process, right? Mm-hmm. That part is so, there's so many misconceptions around it, but at the same time, there's a lot of work that goes into it that still doesn't have the spotlight that I think it should. And I'd love to hear your first hand take on it. Um, before you ever started getting, I don't know, let's say contacts from schools or, or programs, whatever the case may be, when you decided you want to go on a path to pro and you, you start putting the work in, how much extra work went into just solely the recruitment process from your perspective? That's a great question. I think it ramped up until I verbally committed. And Mm -hmm. obviously it was, I would say it was fairly exponential in that way too, that starting, because I think there, at least in the, I don't know how it is now, but at the time that I was going through that process, there were rules about when coaches could talk to you and stuff. And so in order to even get to the point where a coach would talk to you, you had to not only be talented enough or be, you know, hardworking enough, you had the character, all that stuff. You had to have the grades. So most coaches, especially at the higher level, you look at who's won the national championships, all of those colleges at the D1 level. And again, I didn't play D1 soccer, but if I did, all of the best schools are also all the best soccer programs, Stanford. Mm -hmm. Virginia, UVA, you know, you look at all these crazy schools and they're also incredible at soccer. And so they're not just recruiting footballers, they're recruiting student athletes. Yep. And so there's, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? It's like the volume of things. There's so many building blocks you have to nail out or iron out before you even get to the point where having that conversation with a coach, either face-to-face over email, text message, call even happens. And so that stuff has to be compounding from the time you're, you know, 13, 14. Obviously, some players are, uh, I would say, lucky potentially that they kind of fall into it and they're really sure. gifted and, and they kind of find that passion later. Fair enough. No problem there. But for a lot of us, it's it's a it's a grind from day one to get the gr- make sure you're focusing on grades, make sure you're focusing on being a good person. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but that's for, for some people, that's really difficult. <laughs> like that's, yeah, it's just yeah, you're not lying. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you've got a, if you've got a youth career that's littered with red cards and yellow cards and moving clubs because of personality issues, you know, recommendations, like all these things really matter. And a college coach takes that into account. And there's a, there's a great, Gary V was talking about this the other day where he goes, you know, I was talking to the Jets guy and we got our first pick in the NFL draft. And then our next pick, we decided to get somebody who should have gone like fifth or sixth round. And so he talks to the GM and he goes, Hey, so why'd you pick him? And he goes, well, the, the, the GM of the Jets goes, well, I have a star player who has the ability to go out the night before a game party as hard as he wants and he'll rush for 300 yards the next day. He's absolutely brilliant. But the guy that I picked in the fifth round is the dude that's going to keep six other players from going out with that guy who can't handle the party. Right. So it's, it's that character. So even people think like, Oh, character is overrated. You can do kind of whatever you want it's a huge piece of the recruitment process. And if you're upfront, you're professional, you're able to have conversations, you're able to, uh, one thing that I think is a vastly underrepresented thing in the recruitment process is being able to sell yourself. So how do I, how am I able to, you know, if you're a coach who I want to go to your school, how am I able to sit either on zoom with you or on the phone and say, Hey coach, it's not what, what I can get from you. It's what I can provide to your program. Value. It's a total. Yeah, exactly. It's a value proposition. Yeah, hundred percent, man. I think mm-hmm. I, I think you know it right in the head. Value and and, and look, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper here. I mean, throughout this recruitment process, I think you're you're juggling all of those things mentally. You're trying to make sure your your you know your your character's in the right place, your academics are in the right place. You you don't lose a step on the field, right? You're juggling all of these things, but then on top of all of this, and it's a layer that doesn't get talked about enough. You have a plethora of options, right? Mm-hmm. And you're thinking about okay. 
it's like we're asking, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds to imagine where they want to spend the next four years of their life, where they want their next home to be. And that's a massively intimidating question. Um, and so I imagine the parents played, your parents probably played a, a significant role in helping you understand what your options were and what you can expect out of them. What were those conversations like? I mean, were you guys having conversations at the dinner table regarding how you were feeling about the options that you had? Like, walk us through some of that part of the process. Definitely. I would say the biggest lesson I learned was actually lucky enough from an older cousin of mine who was, she. I think she's seven or eight years older than me. So, so again, okay. her experience would have been completely different to my experience from a youth perspective as well. But she was on the Spokane Shadow, which at the time was the one of the best teams in the state. They were in the final every year down at Starfire. And so we used to go watch her play. She was fantastic. Absolutely rapid outside back. And she got a full ride to Harvard for soccer. Wow. Not only was she a 4.0 student, she was, you know, again, she had everything. All of That's her insane. stuff was <laughs> ready to go. And at the time, the Harvard women's team was top, 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 top. So she gets a full ride to Harvard in the spring. So she and women or girls, I guess, whatever. Anyway, they get, they can be spoken to a lot earlier than the guy's side can be for programs. At least that was the case when I was there. So sure. one of my classmates who was 15 could already be signed to a college and I would have to wait even to talk to a, you know, a coach for later on down the line. But anyway, I'm digressing a little bit here, but the lesson that I learned from her is that in the spring that coach got sent to Penn state. So, and said, basically they said, okay, hey, Noah's cousin, come with us and we'll start you. You're going to be an integral part of our new program. We're going to build the program around you and these other women, young women that we're bringing in. And she got to Penn State, tore her ACL sophomore year and absolutely hated being there. Wow. But she loved the Harvard campus. So now the question is, if you're going to go to school, do you choose the school or do you choose the soccer program? And for me, because I knew that my parents were like, you're going to school for four years until you get your diploma or three years or whatever it takes you, you got to go to the school. The only question that I was asking myself is, I guess the easiest way to break it down was, okay, cool. I'm going to go visit the couple schools that I think have a good vibe. And if I don't like the vibe, they're immediately off the list. It doesn't matter how good the money is, how good the coaching staff is, how good everything else is. If I don't like being on campus with the people, forget about it. Because if I get injured, which, oh, by the way, junior year, I had a surgery, double hernia, and I was on campus without being able to play. And I loved the school I was at. So that's always been and always will be my philosophy, just because that's the, that's the story, at least, that I tell myself in my head. Yeah, seriously, man. And look, I wish I, I yeah. wish we could have met earlier so I could have taken some of that advice, man. I mean, <laughs> I made probably the same I won't call it a mistake. I think it's it's a, it's a learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I chose a D2 program simply because of the coach and his his pedigree and you know, the players that he would pump out of that program. They were top 5 nationally every year. And um, you know, the the academic experience was secondary to my choice. And mm. I sure enough, like most players do after one year, I got hurt um, multiple times, but the last one was so bad that I was kind of out for anywhere between six to nine months. And um, I hated it, man. I hated it. I, I really didn't like being on campus. I didn't have any like tried and true close friends. I, I found myself wanting to go back home on the weekends and things like that. And mm -hmm. thankfully it was only a couple hours away from where I lived. So that could have been possible on certain weekends, but you're a hundred percent right. I think you have to ask yourself, um, how much of this experience are you willing to sacrifice just to play soccer? And in my opinion, you are a student first. You should be choosing a program based off what your holistic experience is going to be, not just one, in, in retrospect, tiny aspect of it will be. So Absolutely. very, very interesting. Man. I think that's strong advice for anybody to, to take. So with that said, man, let's let's scale it up a bit. Um, you know, you played college ball. You got through it. You had a fantastic time. You're still on this path to pro. When does pro become a little more real for you, right? You've traveled a bit. So take, take us through. How did that whole process work out? Yeah. So I think pro started to become really real when we had a coaching switch, actually sophomore year. So after freshman year, our coach had been at the school for a long time. And so a new coach came in and I just said, I have nothing to lose. So I walked up to him one of his first days and he, and I said, this is not my end. 
I am going to go play professionally and I will do whatever you say, because you have the, you have experience at that level, not only personally, but also, uh, you have connections in that space. I said, show me how to do it. What do I need sure. to do? And so we walked through a whole plan. He was giving me guidance on the side and going into senior year, he basically told me, cause at that point I was at the level now where it was. I don't want to say easy, but like division three soccer was pretty easy for me. Like it wasn't, it wasn't very difficult and which again, right, wrong, or different. I have no judgment on it. It's just what it is. And mm -hmm. he first day of preseason senior year, he goes, I want you to go and play your best, enjoy yourself. But first and foremost, he said, I want you to just lower your expectations for this year and be the best leader you can be. And that changed my perspective on that entire year. And it ended up being like the most successful year personally, but as a team as well, because it was, I was able to really step into that leadership role, show guys what it meant to, you know, Hey, even if we're only here for five months, six months together, what does it look like to just push towards that finish line, push towards, you know, every next weekend. And so that was fantastic. But uh, yeah, junior, junior, senior year was, you know, you're training five days a week. Off seasons are a little bit more lax, which a lot of guys, you know, take easy, which is great. Totally fine. Uh, it was harder in the springtime when we were not in season for me because I knew that I had to prepare for what was next. And so yep. that's also what made the season so easy for me because I had I had grinded every day hours in the racquetball court playing 1v1s with teammates and you know what like there was this old joke we had in college where guys would literally rotate every day to play me 1v1 in the racquetball courts for like two hours until we were dead and I would just like rotate whoever was training with me every day and each you know some of my friends each had like a day of the week they would come and it was a yeah it was a whole thing but <laughs> yeah, no, it was a blast. It was, it was a blast, but it was a lot of work. It was a ton of work because I knew that I was already disadvantaged contextually in the U.S. being at a D3 college program because coaches look and say, oh, he's, you know, he's D3, he's not D1 or D2. And so I knew I said, OK, I'm D3. Like, I got to do the extras then. I got to do the extra stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. 100 percent. And so the extra stuff, where did how far did that really take you? Right. I mean, like you have a crazy journey past what you're doing now playing wise. Um, I want to dig into that aspect of it all, right? You traveled. Mm -hmm. um, so when did the switch from, you know, exiting college, moving into, you got your degree, moving into, you want to keep playing, you want to keep being competitive. Um, where did the first pro contract come from? How did you feel? And what did that lead to? What doors did it open? Absolutely. I would say, uh, ju so junior year of college, I actually studied, well, studied abroad in Denmark and I was able to play over there. And I got a couple trials at some amazing professional clubs that I ended up having to say no to, even though they wanted to sign me because of college and NCAA rules and stuff. So that yeah. to me right away was like, Ooh, proof of concept. Like I'm here, yeah. I'm at that level, I'm ready to go. And so it got me even more fired up for what was next. And as soon as I graduated, four weeks later, three weeks later, I was on a plane to Spain. And so I wow. landed in uh, San Sebastian, which is uh, in, in Northern Spain, where the Antiguoco Academy is. And that's where players like, I think David Silva was there and uh, Xavi Alonso. And so, Dude. yeah, amazing. That's insane, bro. Yeah. So, you know, again, coming straight out of college, I was in Walla Walla, Washington, you know, little wine country. And all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, it's like, you're in Spain playing with like, proper footballers. Very different, very different. And I got signed at a team called Real Union de Rune, which was uh, like literally running distance. We would run on team runs into France and back. That was like how close it was on the border. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, uh, <laughs> in Northern Spain. So that was fantastic. Uh, amazing experience. So the only unfortunate part was that the team wasn't for whatever reason able to sponsor me and give me a visa. And so mm -hmm. I had to go home after, I think I was, I left after 13 or 14 weeks. So I was there for a decent amount of time, but again, it's, it was one of those situations. Like it's, it's the things I can't control, right? We, I met with lawyers. Yeah. I did everything in my control to try and stay and to try to meet with the president of the club and do all this other stuff. And, uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, I guess. And that's, you know, fair enough. Again, as you sort of, as you alluded to earlier, like that's a learning experience. It's a beautiful learning experience. And yeah, so I ended up 
popping out back into the US around August or September, I guess, after graduating. And at that time, that was middle of the season, zero transfer window, you know, transfer windows were done. And I was like, okay, I have time to grind until the sort of the winter season, I guess. And yeah. so I said, okay, what can I control? I can control where I live, how I work, what I'm doing. So I actually moved back to my college town because I had called my college coach as soon as I landed. And I said, Hey, is there any chance that I can, you know, come on as like a volunteer assistant coach so that I can use the gym for free, use the facilities, use all the training equipment, use all the recovery machines, the ice bath, like every, cause they had everything right. Like as, yeah. as you know, college programs are better than most pro setups in the United States as, as far as like, especially in the D one level. Right. And so I said, why don't like, why not do that? That's so easy. And it's four hours drive from home. Let's do it. So I move back to the college town. I'm working three different jobs, wow. volunteering as the assistant to try and, you know, make enough money to stay and training at five, six in the morning for a couple hours going and doing, I worked at a, a winery. So I did like a tasting room where I could, you know, through, I don't know, I guess, charisma, make extra tips. Like I was, I basically was like, how can I maximize the amount of money that I can make through the job? So other than, you know, maybe consulting and stuff in a small town, it's food. So you can, how do, can you wait and be really kind to people and try to get tips there? Or you do the winery thing. And so the yeah. winery thing, and then I would go winery from like, I don't know, 9am till 4pm and then work the night shift five to 11 at the restaurant. And that was on repeat Jeez, four to six days a week for the entire fall. And so grind, 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 grind. We get to the winter time. I'm on the phone with agents all the time and reaching out. And this is, I think where similar, this is just an echo of getting into college, right? Like college is, it's the same fundamental building blocks, except you don't have the academics. Now you just have what your resume is for college, how many goals, assists, and all that stuff. You still have to be a good person. You still have to vouch for yourself. You have to be even better at selling yourself at that point, which again is huge. It's that value proposition, right? Because if yeah. they're actually going to pay you, how do we, how do, how do you go? So then I ended up going to a bunch of open trials, signing with LA force in the inaugural NISA season in 2019. And the rest is kind of like, now we're started. Now I've got traction. Now I've got, you know, some, some things to grab onto. And then we start building up from there, traveling to some other countries as well. So. Yeah, yeah. man. Wow. That is, that is a hell of a journey, man. I will say that. <laughs> I think, uh, I think the work you put in, we talked about it before, right? Work from like a player standpoint, all the, you know, the, the, the hours of, and, and the number of touches, the volume that you need on a daily or weekly basis has to be massive. But then mm -hmm. on top of that, right. You put that aside and it's like when you don't necessarily have the perfect opportunity right in front of you, you have to go out there and create it. And you have to be willing to put the, the, the time in consistently, right? You mentioned six, sometimes seven days a week, working multiple jobs, we're volunteering your time just to train, just to have proper, you know, facilities and whatnot, man. That's something that I think, you know, even outside of athletics, there, 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 there probably aren't too many people out there that are willing to put that level of work in to get what they want. I think it's a, it's a true testament to your character, 100%, Noah. Um, for, so, so past that point, let's talk about Nisa a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And your experience now as a pro player in this country in a growing league where I think right now every every grassroots league, every um, every player or fan is kind of benefiting from this very subtle boom of soccer in this country. I think it's, you know, it's we're still in its infancy. It's in its earliest days. It can only get bigger and better from here. But you came in um, during kind of an inaugural season for a NISA club. And that's, dude, I can only imagine what that's like. Like walk us through that. And how does that compare to like maybe the rest of the American soccer landscape? Definitely. The inaugural season was a rough one. That was just barely any fans. No one knew who we were. People are like, oh, you're a pro? What's Nisa? You know, there's all this misconception about, you know, what the pro level is and yep. the juxtaposition. And and here's the thing, too, is we're now in 2023 and just kicking off a couple of weeks ago. And you still see this juxtaposition. I was at LA Force and we got very little fans, whether that and, and to Potentially it was the marketing, potentially it was what, whatever the reason was for the lack of fans there, there just wasn't any. And then you went to our crosstown rivals, Cal United, and they played in Championship Stadium, which was the host of, I think Sac Republic still plays there. Or one of the one of the massive Irvine teams from the championship 
was in that stadium. And so wow. we'd go to Cal United and we'd play in front of 3000 people. And it was like, whoa, some of the guys had never seen that many people in one place before. Right. And so, and, and that's still the case now. I mean, we get, we get a decent number here at flower city, but when we played LA force last year, they still had pretty little fans and it just, you go there and then you go to a Chattanooga now and Chattanooga routinely will host six, seven, 8,000 people. They've got wow. drums. They've got chanting the entire 90 minutes. I mean, it's a full thing. And so you get that juxtaposition in a, in a new league and that's, it's super cool and exciting, I think. And it also as an older player being in the league. It gives me such excitement for the next generation of players who, you know, I've got 22, 21, 20 year olds in our locker room who I get to put a hand around and be like, dude, let's see what happens when you continue to improve. Cause this yeah. league is only going to explode just like MLS next will just like USL one will USL championship. All these other leagues are popping up and it's like, man, the opportunity, like the opportunity here is so crazy now. Dude, I, I and that's something I really want to hone in on. That's kind of why I ask you the question, right? Is like some people discount anything past MLS, MLS Next, or the USL Championship, right? It's like, no, nah, I mean, is the opportunity even really worth it? Like, what will I, how much visibility will I actually get? What's the marketing like? How much money will I make? All those are valid questions, but I do think that sometimes as soccer fans in a part of the world where this is still considered a niche sport, we need to think in wider time horizons, mm -hmm. right? And and not necessarily what the short-term gain is, but how can our careers and the passion that we have for those careers benefit long-term? Is there a piece of advice you would give to a player who's maybe at the height of their college game, regardless of the division that they're in, maybe they're, you know, NAIA, right? And they're just kind of like, like, like dominating in that, in that athletic association and they're making it work, but they don't know what comes after that. They want to keep playing and maybe, maybe they've seen, you know, NISA branding or messaging, or maybe they've seen some of these other leagues that are still very much in their infancy start to grow. Is there a piece of advice you give to that player who is kind of discounting what those leagues stand for? One is you're going to get out what you put in. So the investment, if I'm super excited and I have a great attitude and I'm process focused and I'm doing all the right things at a NISA level, you better believe the rest of the guys around me are going to be doing the same thing because they're watching me going, wow, this guy's on a different wavelength, right? Yep. So, and then you get that back and then it's right there. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're the top NISA team and the rest is history. The yeah. second thing I would say is, and, and this is something that I've exercised continuously, even this last off season finished with flower city and I went to an open tryout, but there's also the rhetoric around open tryouts that it's a money grab and it's this and it's mm. that. And it's like, yeah, but no one's above that unless you're being paid millions and millions a year and you're the top MLS prospects or you're Ronaldo or you're Neymar or whatever. You're those, you're the upper echelon, which for everyone, but probably like a millionth of a percent of the soccer players in America, you aren't that upper echelon, right? You're yeah. not a Reyna, you're not a Pulisic, you're not a, you know, one of those guys. No one else is above that stuff. So how are you going to get seen? Being on a team is better than not being on a team. A guy who's playing in Nisa is going to get a much bitter, bigger look than a dude who came in, to, who came out of college, went a whole gap year without playing, but had the possibility to, but decided not to, because it was a, below them. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Plain and simple, man. I think I, I think I, I couldn't agree with that statement more. I think you're either playing or you're not playing. The level of competition always does matter. But if you don't have any offers to go into the USL Championship or to go into MLS Next Pro or like whatever the case may be, you you take the cards that you were dealt, so to speak, yeah. right? And you, playing is always better than not playing. We we really can't say it better than that on this show. I love that, man. Um. And as we get closer to kind of winding this down for the episode, I think the last part that we really haven't covered today is content creation. The, that own journey all by itself, man. And look, I, I think anybody who creates content on the edge of the internet today, you understand how much of a grind that really is. And you could, you pair that with the journey you're on from a soccer perspective. And I can already see how your day is way more than full, more full than most people. So if, if, and again, we don't have to like, you know, we can dig in, 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 into this as much as you really want to, but when did content creation really become something that you really kind of became passionate about? And 
What's it like juggling that with the pro soccer journey that you're on today? I'd say it was a, it's, it's love through trial and error. I think that's <laughs> the best way I could say it. I had gotten really interested by starting a YouTube channel a long time ago, probably back in college when I was actually working the several jobs. And I was like, of course, my, the, the way that my brain works is like, what else can I put on my plate? You know, like what, what's, the, <laughs> what's, what's an even more busy schedule I can do. And yeah. uh, so I think, but it never really caught full time, I guess. And so we didn't cover this at all, but where I met my wife, which was actually in Australia, uh, that was the season after LA force. And I got to Australia in January of 2020. And we all know after 2020, you know, beginning of 2020, that's kind of when Corona hit and it was a whole thing. Yep. And we, and Australia was completely shut down. And I said, Oh, this is an opportunity. Like this is a huge, everyone's online, everyone's doing this. And so I said, okay, cool. I'm just going to start filming with a little GoPro that I had. Uh, bought it like a local, you know, the equivalent of like a Best Buy in Australia and a microphone and started filming, did day in the life, did like trial and error with little two minute Tuesday videos or two minute techers. I think I called them like they're, I think they're still up on my channel and they're horrendous to watch, but they're so, <laughs> they're, but they're fun, you know, it's whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then I really started to get into researching and, and we talked about process focused, right? So if I, if my goal then is to make and open my eyes to what the ability of a personal brand and a media system, I guess, for a personal brand can actually be and become and the sort of limitless, there is no ceiling to it of what number one, monetarily you can get out of it. But number two, amazing opportunities to work with new people. Right. Yep. And so, I mean, God, you probably would not have ever reached out if I didn't have a media channel. Like that's just exactly. You know, I was just right? about to say that. Yep. Yeah. And so that's to me, like that's, that's, that could be the only reason that you do it is just to connect with really cool people. And it became then a process of learning to love the editing and diving really deep into editing. And now I'm, you know, filming on nicer cameras and I've got drone shots and I'm being, I'm, I'm exercising that creative muscle in my brain that's completely separate from football. And that is so relieving in so many ways because it just gives me a chance to decompress, even if the content is what I love, which is football, right? So, yeah. and I've jumped into football boots as well, which is a huge side passion as well. So that's, that's fantastic. But it really just was, uh, okay, I, I can do this and I can really see myself doing this and I enjoy doing it and it's fun and I can dive into different editing techniques and different filming techniques and, you know, how, how do we film in certain, certain lighting conditions and what can a studio look like and all this stuff and photos and it, it sort of just took off. And for me, that's like the numbers really don't matter to me that much, honestly. Like I, I do it, yes, to s supply income and stuff on a practical level. But at the end of the day, YouTube is and content creation is fun. It's super fun for me. And so that's at the end of the day, like that's why I do it. I love it, man. Seriously. I think, and look, you're, you're right. I mean, it's what more can you add to your plate, right? That's the, 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 <laughs> the, that question is limitless from a content perspective. There's always more you can be doing. But with that said, I think, you know, the compounding effect, like you mentioned, right? There's like limitless scale to media. And what's crazy about it is I used to have this very myth-like belief that, and this is probably why I never created content leading up to right around the pandemic time. Um, but this channel even came after that. I would say that, you know, it, I always had this belief that you would create a piece of content and you, you, you publish it and it would just be lost in the internet forever. And it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. But why would I put, so, why would I pour so much of myself and so much effort into that when I'm not going to reap the benefits immediately? And that again, mm -hmm. right? Longer time horizons. And what I didn't realize was the compounding effect that somebody could reference one of these interviews that we do months after, years after. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be on our channel. We can always bring users back to these moments that we have on this show, just like you could always bring users back to any training session you've ever done, any one of those two-minute videos that you mentioned. I mean, hell, even the cleat reviews that you do, right? When you pull those, I, I, I've seen those on your channel. I think all of those things, they make up who you are creatively. Uh, but then past that, I think there's just limitless opportunity when you have a personal brand that's carried by your content and by your channel. And so when you're playing Days Are Done, 
I think you're still going to have some real options because of the fact that you haven't been scared to put yourself in front of a camera and put the work in to make sure the content was good, man. I think that's awesome. Uh, before we wrap up, is there any, I, again, I'll go back to, I think there's so much that our users can, can really kind of learn from you. Any advice for someone who is a player, maybe they're a high level player, regardless of where they are in their competitive journey, but maybe they want to also create some content and they feel like, I don't have the time or it's so much work or where am I, where am I going to learn how to do this while I'm still training and learning other aspects of my game? Is there a piece of advice you'd give to that person who's been hesitant so far? That, oh, I could go any matter of different directions on this one. Uh, <laughs> I would say that in the same way that you pursue football, you can pursue anything else. Skills are transferable anywhere in life. So I've just reverse engineered the same stuff that I did for my footballing career, not, not selling and well, in some ways selling myself, but the hard work, the focus, the dedication, all that stuff. And you just put it into something else. And it's the same concept. You're going to fail yeah. a ton. You're going to succeed a little bit. And that micro succession or micro success, I guess, compounds over time. I wish I could show a graph. I wish I was able to like share my screen so I could show you the YouTube studio, but literally from the moment the channel started three years ago or some now, it's like flat. And I was getting very little views, very little, whatever. But you know, you, if you, if you really want a reality check, go throughout your day and be super, super brutally honest with yourself and write down timestamps of what you did. And I guarantee you can find an hour to watch a YouTube video about how to start a YouTube channel. Yeah. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. There's always, I agree. You, you can make time for stuff. Audit your time. And like you yes. said before, right? The compounding effect, be consistent, right? Be consistent. And more importantly too, because I think it's really, um, you know, in, in this age of the internet where, you know, students of life or the game or whatever the case may be, young people, they who doesn't want to have a career as a YouTuber, right? Then the harsh realities come in that first year, those first two years where <laughs> the growth is so minimal. You're, you're, you're second guessing every thought you ever had about it. But yeah. I, but I will say that, you know, in a world where, you know, there tends to be a lot of mimicking on the internet or people wanting to do things like another YouTuber, they saw be authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Be yourself. Uh, I think over time you'll find, the, the niche or the corner of the internet that suits you well or suits you the most. And then you double down and then you increase the volume of content. You, you increase the quality of the content. You get better over time. All of those things have massive compounding effects. And I think in all honesty, Noah, you're, you're living proof of that, man. So again, man, I'm, I'm so glad we did this. I'm so glad that I had you on the show today. I think that there's a ton of value for anybody to unpack from this. And, and hopefully we get to do a rerun of this at some point in the future where we can talk about what you're doing, you know, post soccer days, I'm sure your content creation career is only going to continue to evolve and elevate you and your personal brand over time. So there's a lot that you should be excited about and that any one of your, your channel fans should be excited about. So again, Thank you, my man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Well, if you made it to the end of the episode, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you. If you haven't done so already, like the, 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 the video down below, subscribe to the channel. And before we go, Noah, any shout outs you want to give? This is kind of your, your, your time to shine. No, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. This has been fantastic. And drop of a hat, you let me know and we'll do a second episode. Awesome, man. I really appreciate it. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, I really appreciate it from everybody here at Box to Box. My name is Jose Tejas. I am your host. And uh, from everybody here at Goals TV, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time.